and focus on making and creating adequate impact. She's unapologetically a feminist and a constitutionalist. She fearlessly and courageously takes on corporations and governments when it comes to protecting rights of people. She's helped shape and redefine legislation, especially around gender justice and freedom of speech in India. Please welcome the very dynamic Karuna Nandi. Hi, Karuna. Good evening. Hello, and thank you for having me. Thank you for agreeing. for the usual, you know, very intensely cerebral webinar. I'm just so pleased to be on a relaxed Sunday chat. Thank you. And we're, so <laughs> glad. we're so glad to see that lawyers have that side to them and they're willing to display it. So thank you. Please meet with Vikas, my friend and colleague. He's, he's going to take over from here. Vikas, over to you. Great. Hi, Karuna. Hi, Vikas. Great. And uh, hopefully it won't be too relaxed because Denisha runs the interrogation like a, you know, a real cracks whip with that. So hopefully it'll be less relaxed later on. I suppose we've got to be on the other side sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, um, so this, this kind of whole journey we do with Unsuited is really to look at the uh, kind of personal journeys you know, lawyers have you know, in their career and, and what got them to even you know, start in their careers you know, as lawyers. Um, and with yourself, you know, your parents gave up bright careers at Harvard Medical, Medical School and the LSE in London to come back to India. And your mother, you know, set up the very first Bastic Society for Children as well in North India. Um, and your own journey has been uncannily similar, where you worked with the UN to re before returning to work at the Supreme Court, focusing on constitutional law, commercial, media, and tech law. So how did the kind of choices that your parents made when you were younger influence you, you know, and your journey, you know, from to return and becoming a lawyer here? You know, I saw that uh, giving up money and at that time academic um, recognition because, you know, my father was at Mass General, which was the Harvard Medical School Hospital and my mother got the History Prize at the LSE. So giving up academic re recognition, giving up money, giving up, you know, comfort brought them so much happiness, you know. Wow. In the sense that it, not the giving up of it, but what they got from where they came. So my father came back to Ames to because that's the that was the top public hospital at the time, and that's where all sorts of people could come. I mean, of course, ministers would call, and if a minister would call, then uh, he would say that I'm not going to see you. Right? Really? <laughs> All sorts of trouble, yeah. And if there was some VIP who came, and VIPs also went to Ames at that time, even now they go to Ames quite often, right? But they would stand in line and they would wait. Like, and the poor person who came first would be seen first. So wow. I just, you know, I mean, they got penalized left, right, and center for it, but they were happy. And um, that's, and I was born here, you know, and the sense of purpose. And the reward that they got from it was just so evident that it was it, it was vital, I thought, for me to find a vocation, you know. Mm. And, um, you know, I think uh, work is like love, that you find it, either you find it or you don't. It's, it's just a sense, of, it's, a, it's luck. And so I dated a lot of careers. <laughs> 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 I uh, uh, I kissed a lot of frogs. I was uh, my first uh, internship was in feminist publishing. Um, actually, everything gave something to me. I don't want to I don't want to downgrade any of that because it was all quite rewarding. It just wasn't my home, you know. Um, and then I was in uh, um, I did a, uh, some social work. I did a donkey survey, you know, <laughs> as to the sort of problems of donkeys and mines. I mean, this was all in college. Uh, I acted and I was a sort of decent actor or a barely competent actor at my very best. I was just barely competent, you know, so it was blatantly not my thing. I, um, you know what, that's probably not even a bad thing in today. If you watch Bollywood, then uh, you're probably as good as some of them. You know, I have a lot of respect even, for some of Bollywood now. Like, they some, do some of them, really yeah. work, right? You also uh, did this. And then I became a TV journalist. And then I, you know, and then I applied to film school, law school, journalism school. I had an economics degree. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I walked into class. 
uh, in law school and there was this, you know, the, uh, the first day I had a bunch of really, really cool professors. So um, I've told the story before of Janet O'Sullivan, who was really pregnant when she was sort of teaching us taught the first day, right? And just hilarious. Like she would just, the way she lit up your mind. I mean, she would just have funny stories about taught. And it would make sense and you would remember stuff, right? And then the same day we had Graham Burgo who taught us the difference between assault and battery. So he took a ball and he threw it. This is, this is English law. Uh, this was in Cambridge, right? So he threw, a, he pretended to throw a ball and the first row is a bit like, whoa. And that was in English law, assault. Whereas if the ball hit the person, then that is battery, right? An incredibly simple way to illustrate an idea that in words can get a little more complex. So honestly, I was taught by a sort of old white imperialist constitutional law and I got a first in constitutional law. But, and you know, my, my uh, closest friend in that class was uh, uh, the daughter of the former president of Cyprus. And we used to make fun of him all the time, but of course not to his face. And we used to ask difficult questions, right? And um, it was, you know, it really lit up my mind. I'm not saying that imperialists should teach law, but what I'm saying is that despite. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But then what, what drove you to come back then? Because I see your parents, you know, gave up their careers and that, and you said you finally found kind of, uh, you finally found a date you were happy with, you know, when you got into, you know, law school. So then what made you run away from that? And well, not run away. What made you say, you know, I want to come back to India and, and practice that? Yeah, because I'm going to interject here. You also worked with the UN, right, Karuna? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that must have been a very, very fulfilling experience. But you chose to sort of transition back to India, like Vikas was saying, move away from that um, and, and do this. So why? What, what, what really happened there? I had been away for six years then. I had a New York bar um, qualification. I was working at the UN. I was getting paid lots of money, tax-free. I was very impressed with myself. <laughs> and you know, I'm sure. all people in New York, what you did, they were very impressed with you. I was sitting in this tall building. And then at some point I really felt that there was so much human rights work to be done in India, you know? And also I felt that there were lots of different reasons. Uh, I also felt that there was a lot of room I felt to contribute just also a general lawyer because I represent a lot of companies. You know, I just don't represent companies that I feel conflicts with, right? Um, I mean, something has to fund the human rights work, right? <laughs> and, uh, I, and I also read an article by Harsh Mandar about the Gujarat riots. And... I was just, you know, I was thinking, how can this happen in my country? And I really felt the call. And I am uh, very unashamedly patriotic. I really love this country. And I'm of this land. And I, the culture and people, and I speak, you know, my, uh, language it's not just it's not just the indian languages i speak it's not just the bengali and the hindi right it's also the english is indian yeah. so this 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 love and of course i also feel connected to the human rights violations in rwanda that were happening at the, uh, around that time right like the genocide in rwanda and i feel like it is all our responsibility you know this idea of vasudhaiva kutumbakam the, the world is one family um, i think that's really important and I am a deep internationalist. But at the same time, the world is divided into, for better or for worse, into sovereign nations, right? And the site for the claiming of rights is primarily national. So yes, international law is something that is important, is something that um, I think I'm a great believer in, I think needs to be strengthened. I also think it cannot be victor's justice, you know? It can't be, it can't be US justice, for example. And I mean, we're seeing that particularly now, the ridiculousness of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but it can't be victor's justice. And there's a huge critique of, you know, international criminal law as victor's justice. So I think there are a lot of problems there that need to be fixed, but 
I still very much believe in it. And I feel that that is one of the important sides of my work, that and comparative law, you know, working with other jurisdictions, uh, for example, on the high level panel for media freedom and on the uh, Columbia uh, global panel for free speech. What we're doing is we're looking at different jurisdictions, but we're primarily not looking at international law, right? Like we're pr primarily looking at different jurisdictions uh, uh, and how in national jurisdictions and national courts rights are claimed and how rights can be claimed. Of course, where there is a, a, a international court or international forum where this can be effective, sure, absolutely, nothing like it. But that is not common. So, so, so you're saying it was the uh, kind of... You know? Are you saying that the trend is that the trigger for that was the Gujarat riots? Or what you were reading about it, you know, when you were overseas, that, that was the kind of trigger that you were... It was one of the triggers. You were... It was one of the triggers. I moved back for many different reasons, but it was one of the major triggers, yeah. And I moved back and I worked um, uh, as an OSD, an officer on special duty to... Um, uh, the National Human Rights Commission, that was the only organization at the time was doing anything about it. It was headed by the former uh, Chief Justice of India, Justice Verma. And I wrote to him and I said, you know, can I come and work with you? And he wrote back and he said, sure, <laughs> you know. So, so that was a great, that was a great start. And I also started my um, litigation work at about the same time. Okay. Um, and then, I mean, even talking about, you know, your this concept of internationalism, nationalism, and you, know, you have a kind of feeling for humans everywhere, right? And I think you've said in a TED talk that humans are wired to be connected and to be empathetic. Um, and balancing the human rights side and corporate side, it's very easy. And, you know, we can kind of have a stereotype that lawyers seem to have shelved that instinct to be connected, humane, empathetic. So how do you manage to maintain that humane and empathetic side? And especially in today's environment, which is increasingly polarized and cynical. You know, because I think it's very important for us to be integrated, for our minds to be integrated with our hearts, to be integrated with our spirits. And these are all sort of artificial words in a sense. It's still a whole person, right? Which is why I only represent cases that I can absolutely fight for. Of course, some of the issues that I represent are extremely emotive. So when you're representing uh, a, a rape victim or when you're representing one of the Bhopal cases or when you're representing, you know, somebody who's been thrown in jail for a joke, something as stupid as that. Um, I think initially when I was, uh, I've now been in the law for 19 years, right? So uh, when I started, I think I worked very hard on the rational side and was very clear about leaving the rest of me outside the court. And so there was the uh, Koruna Nandi litigator inside court. And I would never have had this conversation, for example, you know. And then there was the me outside court. And these were two di entirely different categories. And like there was no, uh, um, there was the twain met inside me, but not not in um, how I presented a case or how I interacted personally. Well, how I interacted personally, it did, it did come in. I was arguing an excise tax case once and um, got really obsessed with it and talked about it at parties. So, you know, that didn't go so well. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the private side, like the, the heart, the spirit didn't, didn't, didn't come to the courtroom. Now, I think I got a lot more confidence as I grew older and that rational legal side got much more developed and strengthened. And I was able to, I think, then become a lot more comfortable with bringing the rest of my whole self in. You know, the fact that I am uh, a feeling person, right? Um, communicating that to the judge. Because I think that judges, that constitutional courts should care about rights. Of course, they should care about rights, right? Um, I also think that being a woman in court is an incredibly important perspective. It isn't there nearly enough. That being a feminist woman in court is an incredibly important perspective, right? Um, 
not just a feminist woman, a feminist person in court. Like Justice Chandra Chur um, uh, identifies as a feminist and he cited Catherine McKinnon in the Puttaswamy judgment in the nine judges. And it takes, you know, it takes guts to do that. She's a dominant feminist, right? Um, but what he said was just so clear in terms of intimate decision-making and the decision-making of the body. And this is where the right to privacy is so fundamental. And so when I take that Puttaswamy judgment and I take it to the high court to argue that marital rape should be criminalized, right? Then I am attempting to bring the perspective of millions and millions and millions of women into the courtroom. And millions, I'm not kidding, millions of women who are raped every week, right? So I think that bringing that whole self into the courtroom is very important. And, I, and which is why I think so many of us speak of different, you know, kinds of people, of, you know, Dalit women and disabled women. I've never seen a disabled woman, a woman in court, you know? or at least an apparently disabled woman. Um, Muslim women, different kinds of, there are more Muslim women, I think, than, but they, they possibly upper caste Muslim women. But, you know, a, a wide variety, a wide spectrum of people in court. Because, uh, of course, at the moment, for example, we're really worried about the coronavirus and how it will impact judges because most of the judges are over, almost all the judges are over 60 and men, right? Nice. So we're very worried about them. And this kind of brings into sharp relief the fact that this is true. So it's really high time that we, we diversify. Mm. What, what was the, again, what was the tipping point? Because you said when you were younger, you were much more rational and probably uh, operating from IQ. And then you said as you grew older, more of the kind of EQ side came in, which is interesting because we were chatting to Zia Modi last week. And she said exactly the same thing, that when you're a young she, lawyer, it's right. exactly the same, that it's all about IQ. But when you get older, it's important that the balance shifts towards EQ. And that becomes a much more important facet of being a great lawyer because IQ is there anyway. But then EQ is something you develop. So what was the kind of moment that you saw that you were transitioning to having the kind of comfort and confidence to bring your whole self you know, to the law and to the court? You know, because as a woman litigator, um, you can't let up on the IQ. Like, you've got to keep building on it. You've got to keep learning. You've got to stay sharper than, than your competition. You have to be as sharp as you can be because you have to be better than the other person. If you're the same as the other person, it's not going to work. It should be better than the other person, right? It shouldn't be the case. And it's sad, but it is. Um, how did it become, um, I mean, how did that transition happen? I think it was a process. I think it was a process. I think once I got comfortable and I wasn't trying to, and once I understood the rules, see, once you understand the rules, you can play with the rules, right? And once yeah. you, um, uh, and I think I also realized that the rules weren't made for me. The rules were made for people with families in the law, with inherited practices, um, you know, basically for upper caste straight Hindu men, right? So at some point I figured that, of course, I was going to, of course, I was going to play by the rules in order to sort of have a killer instinct and a, the bullseye is to win the case, right? But I wasn't going to play by the rules as to how to get there. Yeah. Okay. That's a good line. We, we, should, we should note that down. It's a good one. Mm. I'm not going to play by the rules <laughs> to, to get there. Very powerful, Karuna. And I think, you, I think your point's even more pertinent today. So as well as the kind of, you know, what's going on with going in lockdown and inequalities, but, you know, the kind of whole Black Lives Matter movement that's spreading around the world, which brings into kind of perspective the um, amount of injustice and the patriarchal structures we have in place that make it very unfair for a lot of people. Um, so I, I want to skip to a slightly different point before we get back onto the kind of you know, inequalities in greater detail. But um, 
you're you're very active on social media right? and you you know and that is not an easy medium to choose in a country like india right and i mean on a personal level i used to be you know do my rants on twitter quite a lot and then i just about two years ago i just gave up said you know what i do not want to be expressing my opinions in a country like this because you get so much nonsense out there and it's a waste of time debating so i just kind of like you know what it's better not to do that on social media but you still do, and you're very active. So what do you see as some of the kind of downsides um, of being on social media, especially given, you know, you don't shy away from hiding your opinion. You know, you're very frank about, you know, taking you know, the bull by the horns, even on social. So but what do you see as the kind of downsides of that? Uh, I think there's a lot of aggression, and there's a lot of aggression against women who voice opinions, right? There, uh, there are le there's less aggression against me because I'm a lawyer, but it was still there to a degree. But I literally, I you're on mute, Karuna. Uh, I think your phone's gone off on mute. Just have to unmute yourself, please. Thank yeah. you. I, I think Karuna, okay. you just you just got hacked because we started talking about social media and uh, <laughs> the trolls. <laughs> Yeah, let's go with that story. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, uh, I just literally, I blocked the whole IT cell. Literally. <laughs> like, and be a, and block, and block. I just block. It, it was, and the thing is that, look, I also do tech policy, right? Like I advise tech companies. And I am absolutely clear that the onus shouldn't be on the user to block. But the option is there. So I exercise the option. And of course, uh, I got, uh, and people would say, but what about free speech? I'm sorry, free speech doesn't mean you have the right to my mind space or my, uh, or, you know, my years or my consciousness. You absolutely do not. You can, I'm not preventing you from speaking to the rest of the world. Go nuts, say what you like. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I blocked the whole lot. So I think that was a, uh, that was a really good process because, of course, there are sort of uh, there are some very intelligent people who are economically conservative and yeah, even socially uh, right wing who make arguments, right, and who can be engaged with and um, and you know obviously those people would not be blocked. You know, I, I follow quite a lot of those people, right, because there's no question of not engaging with ideas, but so much of what he comes at one is not ideas. It's just mm. you know rubbish right mm. that just has to go from my got, i'm not saying it has to go that it has to be banned or it has to be silenced but it just has to go from my consciousness i think the other challenge these days is that the gloves are off yogendra yadav was just implicated in the delhi riots right it's crazy um i'm representing harsh mandar in the supreme court um uh you know, I read the first article I read about the uh, Gujarat riots was by Harsh Mandar when I was sitting in that tall building at the UN. I didn't wow. know him at all. And then when I came to, uh, when I came to um, the NHRC, I met him there because Justice Verma had brought him in to advise his assistant, etc. But so in, in the contempt case, so I've represented him a couple of times in the contempt case. Now let's see how that goes forward. But he is being, he's been charge sheeted, right? And for a speech that is public. So I encourage everybody to actually watch the speech. I mean, the man in his incredibly dulcet, soft-spoken tone speaks about love and speaks about how we must be nonviolent and we must treat each other with love. And um, that's what he talks about. And at one point he says that, yes, the courts will make the decisions, but uh, the decision will also be made on the streets, which, by which he means that uh, there's a democratic consciousness that also contributes to how constitutions get realized, right? But firstly, what happened is that only an excerpt of that was produced in court, which I think is, is crazy. That's wrong. It's so wrong. Um, but, all, but if you really see the whole speech, this, it's ridiculous that he is in a charge sheet. But this is the world we are in. So I think being on social media also brings attention to that. But honestly, I really feel that this is why we practice. This is why we train as lawyers. This is why we train as constitutionalists. Not to 
you know, spout high polluting ideas in the easy times, but to also stand up in the tough times. There's this line, um, there's this line, I think it's from Julius Caesar, which is kill, first kill all the lawyers. And that line is very frequently misinterpreted as being anti-lawyer, but it's not. What the meaning is, was, is that they are the bastion of civil liberties. And if you kill them, if you take them down, then there is no rule of law. Wow. And so I think that in a time where Sudha Bharadwaj is in jail, and she is really, really a stellar person, quite part, I mean, she was at MIT and she went to, I'm in Delhi enjoying a you know, comfortable enough life. She was in Chhattisgarh assisting people who absolutely didn't have any representation. She's, she's not a Mao. I mean, she's as much a Maoist as she is a, you know, Donald Trump, frankly. Right. And she has been in jail for the longest time. So of course there are risks, but this is the time. This is the time that I think tests people's metal. This is the time at which you see who shows up and who doesn't. And this is the time to stand up because what's the point of not living while you're alive? That's true. And that's very powerful. Thanks for that, sharing. That. Yeah, just quick. Do you, do you get that from your parents? Is that you've seen them as examples of living life to the full? That, that kind of drives you to, the, well, supports you, not drives you, but supports you today as well? My mom passed away. Um, and my father's, you know, very much around. But in terms of I think I get it more from my father. No, both from both my parents, from both my parents. I think the idea that if you're doing the right thing, then it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that important so that the consequences are just something that you deal with and, um, Absorb and tolerate because you have done the right. You know? You know, speaking of, of what you said, to pick up from you know, what you said just now, Karuna, you clearly sound extremely passionate about the work you do. And not just the cases you represent, but I think uh, the, the sphere, the general sphere that you operate in is something that you're extremely aware uh, about and, and feel strongly towards. So I'm going to ask you this question. Being a constitutional and a public uh, law practitioner, I'm sure that's very different from the kind of lawyers we are used to largely, well, most of us are used to dealing with, which is the m &A guys, the corporate guys. Even on the litigation side, there's more corporate commercial dispute uh, sort of lawyers that we meet with rather than those who work in the, in the spheres that you do, right? And, and for the kind of law you practice, I'm actually very curious to ask you, how do you draw the line? You know, when, when do you sort of say that, okay, this is it, I'm not going to get involved uh, anymore because for the kind of law you practice on a daily basis, I'm sure you're very invested and also the outcome is something that you're highly, highly attached to because it's, it's going to impact somebody's very basic right, perhaps, like you said, right? So how do you manage, firstly, do you manage to stay sort of neutral and, and slightly detached? And if you do it, then how do you do it? You know, Tanisha, in every case that we do uh, uh, as a chamber, whether it's a human rights case, whether it's a constitutional case, whether it's a commercial case, we put in everything, right? Everything. We work incredibly hard. And, um, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm tough, you know, on myself, on my team. And I'm very clear that we all have to bring our best games to the table. Like our okay. best games, right? Um, but, and also our killer instincts. Mm. But, once you put everything in, that idea of nishkama karma, which means 
work without desire for reward mm -hmm. um the idea the philosophy is that it has to be gained that's does it all this but you know because i love winning i love winning right <laughs> <laughs> but but the idea is that like you put in everything and then it, you know everything in the world is not going to be up to you sure. right you you win some you lose some so you're essentially saying do what's within your control and then just sit back with a hands off approach and and see how it sort of unfolds no but do literally every oh. single thing every single thing that is under your control you know? right yeah. right but tell me like i'm just curious. every single ethical thing i mean that should be taken for granted you know <laughs> no, we- which is in these days but it should be yeah. knowing who you are and and the reputation that precedes you i don't think you need to clarify that at all karuna the, the ethical is is an understood so but i'm actually still i'm still going to probe this a little bit and i'm still very curious so for example you're working with say a victim of uh, for the sake of example and i'm sorry that you know i do want to work with an example so i'm going to take this one on let's say you're working with a victim in a rape case right every night that you're going to bed you you've sure you've read the law you've looked at the evidence you you know your team's put together their best foot forward but when you're going to bed that night are you thinking i really hope we can nail this one I, or you know like that, do you do you obsess over it a little bit is there a tendency to do that of course it? absolutely i obsess about it all the time <laughs> you do but you also but you also there see there's lots of studies to say that if you uh sleep on something then there's a way in which your brain processes and settles the idea and prioritizes what's important and what's not now this is very important in the law right because you've got like a ton of information and you have to prioritize what's important and you have to prioritize what you think is going to appeal to the judge and all of that you have to sort of structure it in like your mind has to structure it right. um i also think it's very important to take a step back and just think about the case okay and this is i think for arguing counsel this is incredibly important because once you've read all of that information you you know all of that law and i am a great believer in due diligence so when i was younger and i was uh, i just come into the supreme court i was yeah i was in my uh, sort of mid 20s i think and i had you know i had opportunity to argue before various additional solicitors general uh, uh, etc in various but particularly tax cases somehow there were lots of tax cases okay and um i used to read every single word you know and i still try to read every single word sometimes i have to rely on um uh, chamber associates colleagues who will but i still try to read every single word for myself right um and some of my colleagues at the time used to say oh you know i only spend an hour on an slp and then i just go in and i say two words to the court and i actually think that's deeply negligent behavior because the um and i'm not making bones about that because i think that the judge could turn to page so and so and i've won cases on precisely that right and say well what about this and then the other person doesn't know and honestly and uh, obviously i'm not going to take names but when we've been up against people who we know don't read and we know don't know their stuff <laughs> this is the strategy we employ right correct that's an yeah. empowering strategy yeah i'm sure yeah understood okay that's that's insightful and and do you ever get into the righteousness of a matter like do you do you ever sit back and say hey do you think this is right or wrong do you ever sit down you do yeah, yeah. and but does that impact how you look at the case or how you work towards it <clears throat> you know we have this thing in my chamber where i uh, when we're preparing for the case when we're prepping for the case so we all sit together and i run my arguments by my team and if we have time then some people uh, go for and some people go against right so it's a moot court and the feminists will argue the the sort of stronger feminists will argue for the uh, rape accused Mm-hmm. and the uh, the others will argue for just for the the purpose of that exercise right mm-hmm. will argue for the complainant or the prosecution and i think that's very important as lawyers because even if i wouldn't take the case of the rape accused unless i was 100% sure you know and yeah it doesn't go by the cab rank principle but i think there are many many deep problems with the cab rank principle right um 
you've got to anticipate the arguments on the other side right and the thing is that you know particularly in human rights we see that people are so excited and swept along by the righteousness of the cause they forget to look at the law you know you can't do that you can't do that because the cause is important you can't not look at the law correct your the, the duty on you to do due diligence is that much stronger you know understood that's interesting i'm actually going to ask you another question which which uh, evaluates some aspect of emotion which is you know when we all went to law school and and this is true for me at least okay i went to glc here in bombay and i walked in saying i'm going to be you know uh, fighting for human rights at some point and then three years of the five year course i did and by year three everybody was talking about corporate internships and you know how we must uh, land ourselves internships at at least mid sized firms then do a little bit of due diligence mna pe work or oh, how much drafting did we manage so we all kind of get swept away into the entire corporate side you know and and we're encouraged to land safe well paying jobs uh, you know don't take too many risks uh, with your career uh, don't go up against people who are you know uh, influential you know this is the kind of dialogue that kind of uh, rules our decision making at the time right and for someone like you 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 uh, walked into law school you may have enjoyed the study of it then you made a conscious decision to pick up one single discipline and you've kind of stuck to it right and you no, you two. have got two so, so i had i think this is important tanisha because i had a business model from the get go right okay. i uh, was very clear that my uh, my first degree was economics mm -hmm. i enjoy my commercial litigation a lot right okay. and it was um, that is what funds the human rights work and i always from the beginning i did both this work now and the, and the thing is that from that i also actually diversified into a large number of other things because the human rights work is of course based constitutional work right it's part 3 of the constitution but also other constitutional work you know some election matters other constitutional work um um uh and then you know i also st have started doing a fair bit of tech law in various aspects media um, and right media but also like the, the fintech i'm currently representing there's there's a few cases on their behalf one is a competition case um um uh, i mean there are there, there's a sort of uh, there's a wide variety of areas in which i am uh, working litigation correct very rarely do you get a silo of law in which you can operate right for example like if you think of the people who are considered greats um fali nariman for example i mean he is something who says this very very specifically not to specialize because take the bhopal cases for example you have a situation where you have union carbide that was an indian company the parent is registered in um, new york the union carbide corporation and then that was taken over in the early 2000s by the dow chemical corporation which is registered in delaware right so there are various corporate veils to be pierced sure. there are various choice of law issues that must be navigated um plus now recently the whole caboodle has been taken over by dupont right so now the thing is that if you're not comfortable with that aspect of the law and you only know your tort litigation right and so what is the human rights work here it's all of it it's the tort law it's the and there's also criminal law aspects the criminal law aspects have been taken um, care of by uh, abhi singh primarily but you know i also do a lot of criminal law for example right but you have to know that if somebody is a uh, proclaimed absconder then their assets can be attached and then how does that interact with fraud and veil piercing particularly when there is a judgment for, from the federal court in connecticut saying that union carbide has specifically uh, uh, evaded that order of the bhopal court where they have been declared a proclaimed absconder in order to bring their um intellectual property into the country through a, a shell company i mean through an agent basically right? right now this basically means that 
union carbide is under the jurisdiction of, uh, and Dow Chemicals who help them do it are under the jurisdiction, according to us, obviously, there are others who will argue the opposite. They, the uh, carbide and Dow will argue the opposite. Um, but if you don't understand these various different aspects of the law, then how are you going to bring it together? Correct. Yeah. So this is, this is I find it interesting. I would, you know, I find it interesting. Um, so I think tax law is one area that can be to uh, an extent siloed off. But even there, you know, customs, you need to know criminal law. Understood. So you're saying it all essentially bleeds in and, and that kind of allows you to seamlessly practice either or and, and move on with, with ease in a way. Yeah. Okay, super. Thanks for sharing. Cool. Slight, slightly uh, different track now. Um, mm -hmm. Going back to another interview you did with um, AIB on a podcast, um, where you said, like, you know, we, we as human beings are constantly growing, and you know, at different times, you know, we will look at things differently. So, can you give us one example of a social issue that um, you've changed you know, your view upon, you know, over the years, you know, as you've started looking at things in a different way, you know, and why? The death penalty. I um, diverged from the people that, you know, from my peers and I thought that why should somebody not be killed if they have done something that is so heinous um, and so sort of out of the bounds of what is, you know, human. Um, and the reason I, uh, it was a journey for me to change my mind, but the reason I changed my mind was because courts very often get it wrong. And the Innocence Project in the US, for example, they, uh, for example, once they get the forensic evidence, they found that the person who was executed was uh, um, innocent. And it's not something that can be reversed. So there are cases that we have where one judge wanted to acquit two judge bench in the Supreme Court, one judge wanted to acquit, the other judge wanted to convict and the person was, you know, killed, right? Plus you see that the, uh, uh, the privileged, uh, uh, cre the creamy layer of our society, right? Never, and that, that domina dominates our uh, public life, that dominates our private life, that dominates our money, that dominates everything. Upper caste, Hindu, privileged, Savarna, straight, able-bodied men. Now you would think with all these characteristics that there'd be very few people. Actually, that's true. There are very few people, but they control everything, right? Mm. And these people are never sentenced to death. The people who are, are poor, Dalit, tribal, Muslim, disproportionately, right? Um, so I think that the idea that this is a deterrent has been so, a deterrent from rape, a deterrent from murder has been so comprehensively debunked by all sorts of evidence. In fact, there's evidence to show that it is, um, that there's a hardening effect on society, that it leads to greater violent crime. In Georgia, for instance, in the United States, because of course criminal law in the states is state by state, right? Um, and uh, there's also federal law, but it's also state by state. Um, the death penalty was taken away and then reintroduced. And after it was reintroduced, violent crime actually went up. Of course, correlation is not causation. But there is also sort of anecdata to show that the correlation in this case was highly likely to have been causation, you know? So, I mean, this is the reason I sort of really changed my mind. And there's no, nothing like the zeal of the converted, right? You know, once you've traveled a bit. Mm. So that, that's more, uh, so your initial viewpoint on changing was more because we just can't get the justice right. So the, the kind of sentence, you know, we make too many mistakes for it to be fair, but... Um, would you think there's an alternative to that? Like, do you still agree that, you know, people that have committed heinous crimes should get punished severely? Um, or we just, or the answer is actually no now because we don't know how to deliver that fairly without too many injustices? Uh, 
I think the carceral system has a lot of problems. Um, having represented a lot of victims in this system, I find that victims' rights aren't addressed nearly enough. You know, what does the victim want? Is the victim protected? Is the victim compensated? Um, I also think that there's a the juvenile justice model in theory, even in India, has a sort of rehabilitative, restorative justice component, and for particular types of crimes, and only when the when the victim wants it, right, um, and. I think those are things that should reshape our carceral justice system. Um, but I also think I would like to see the punishment fit the crime. I would like to see, so for example, you have, you have kids who are, you know, poor kids who have stolen something small and then are in the system for years and then become hardened criminals because then there's no other option, right? Um, Catherine Wu's book is very good on this, Behind the Beautiful Forevers. People don't realize that it's very much about also the, juvenile, the, the justice system and when a poor kid commits a crime, right? Um, of course, I also believe in, I also believe in retributive punishment. But I think that we, we haven't quite gotten it right. I would like to see, a, I would like to see a rapist serve his time in jail but really realize what he's done, you know, and serve that time and be made to understand the, the, the sort of the violence that he perpetrated and the violence that the other person suffered. And if the victim wants um, some kind of redress, some kind of acknowledgement, we don't really have the avenues to make that happen in a safe way that doesn't compromise um, that doesn't compromise anyone, you know? So I think there's a lot of work to be done on our criminal justice yeah. system. Yeah, so until we find a better mechanism for ensuring we deliver um, the right punishment, we should, it's better to back off than, than with such kind of heavy kind of punishment until we can do it properly. Well, I don't think we can back off any kind of punishment, but I think we still have to punish because this is what we've got. Wait, in terms of execution, like, 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 you know, we should penalty. back off from, we should, from, from death penalty, we should back off until we can be 100% sure that we can deliver it in a just manner. Yeah. Um, cool. So it, it also kind of like moves on to the kind of <clears throat> point that, you know, you've spent, you've got your corporate career, which helps fund the human rights part of the, you know, your the work you do. Um, and you spent your career fighting for equality, justice. And I guess even in both avenues, like you were talking about the FinTech company you're representing, and you know, you believe in you know, what they're doing and you'll fight for that. Um, in the current environment, we're in, in terms of lockdown, we're seeing an increasing level of inequality and the migrant labor issue is something that's brought that to the fore. Um, so what advice would you give to the Indian government in today's context and also in general with regards to working on bridging, you know, these large disparities, you know, in, in inequality? I think the most important thing is to not make policy only for people who look like you, right? Because policy was being made, I mean, for example, when you saw the first lockdown and Prime Minister's speech around the first lockdown, um, he was speaking about coming onto your balcony and beating your um, yeah. plate yeah. and spoon. Yeah, don't remind me now, about that. <laughs> right? So, I mean, this was blatantly clear that who was in his mind? The people with the balconies. Now think of who are the people with the balconies. We all think we're middle class. Actually, the vast, vast majority of people, um, even in the audience on this panel, if you look at the actual numbers, are not middle class, are rich in Indian terms. In Indian terms. You may not feel rich because you don't have the full level of education and healthcare and basics that, that are required. But you might well be rich if you look at the curve, right? Um, 
but even out of those people everyone doesn't have balconies right so frankly you've got the people on the balconies who are sort of beating their plates and then you've got the people who are you know walking 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 on the streets under um their shoes wearing out swollen feet in the in the sort of blazing blazing heat and sometimes once they've got to the border being turned back at huge risk of covid without access the same access to healthcare and so i really think that if you don't have the people in mind that you should be serving then you're not going to get anywhere you're only going to serve that limited population and i think that's just a basic of course i have mm. i have lots of things to say but you asked yeah. me for one so i think if i was to say one i think think of everyone think of the poorest person you know the mahatma mahatma gandhi said think of the face of the poorest person that you know and i would add to that the most disadvantaged person you know don't just think of the poorest brahmin that you know brahmin man that you know think of the poorest mahar woman that you know you know um and see whether this is benefiting her or not mm. and then that that would that would apply across both the points of saying about one now in lockdown and two generally about how do we help deliver better quality across this country i'm not sure if we'll get there anytime soon though um i think denisha you want to go over to your bit which is um slightly easing up on the kind of upwards we can go much heavier yes yes absolutely so karuna firstly let me take a moment to thank 